Good morning, church. If you're watching this, it's Sunday morning, and we're going to continue Hebrews chapter 1. I hope everyone is staying safe, and I hope that these messages are edifying in the time that we are not able to meet in person or together as a church. Let's pray and jump right into it. Dear Lord, we do thank you for your goodness and your mercy. We do humble ourselves before your greatness. Teach us to revere you, to know you as our King, as well as our Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> so last week, we looked at the supremacy of Christ, supreme. This week, we're going to look at the superiority of Christ. The difference there is simple. <clears throat> Verse 1 to 4, superiority or um, supremacy is the ultimate authority. In other words, Christ is over all things. This week, and the rest of Hebrews 1, the author is channeling our, our thoughts into the superiority, the superior, in other words, above all things, or greater than all things. And these two things are like two tracks of a train. Our thought, um, our train of thought, okay? And these two tracks, established here in chapter 1, is going to carry our train of thought all the way through Hebrews into chapter 13. His supremacy and his superiority over all things and above all things. <laughs> this morning, I want to ask you hypothetically, if you saw an angel appear before you. <clears throat> the sky goes dark and a man stands in front of you in radiant white with um, the appearance of, of thunder and roaring voice and um, people run away in fear and, and, and cower in in dumbstruck astonishment and amazement and this angel stands in front of you and says I have a message <clears throat> what would you do would you kindly apologize and say that um, I'm sorry I'm running late for work you know and sort of just scoot past him would you ignore him and think, oh, weirdo? Would you hear what he has to say and say, you know what, I'll, I'll consider that. Maybe I'll have time in my schedule next week for that. <clears throat> I'm sure it would be obvious what an appearance like that would ha have on us. <clears throat> and that's exactly this morning what the author of Hebrews is doing from verse 5. He is saying that we are so quick to hear the voice of an angel. You see, the Jewish people revered angels. They were messengers from God. To see an angel was to 
was to be delivered a word from God, and it was it was recorded in Scripture, and um, and that was it. You know, if someone could could prove that they had received a message from an angel, wow, I want to hear what that person has to say. <clears throat> you know, it's not any different today. We put so much emphasis on, on that kind of thing. And we'll get to that in a minute. <clears throat> so he is establishing Christ above the angels. And he is establishing his works and his message um, as the ultimate superiority, greater than all things. That's the purpose of these passages. And he does it by quoting Old Testament scripture, specifically the Psalms. He quotes it seven times. And in various aspects, he is... Um, highlighting the superiority of Christ. Last week, we broke the message up into a few categories, and you'll see that reflected. Verse 1 to 4, you'll see it in 5 to the end of the chapter. Christ is the messenger. Christ is the creator. Christ is the, the representative of God, the representation of God, rather, as the redeemer, as the inheritor. That shines through in these passages, but broadly, these verses that he's quoting emphasizes Christ's kingship as well as his um, lordship, that he's God. We're not going to read all the cross-references. We'll read the passage in Hebrews, and we'll just look at two specific cross-references that um, not summarizes, but is, is a representation of the rest of the passage and all the, the Psalms, Psalms that is quoted. quoted. So, so let's, let's read, read Hebrews chapter 5, five now, now that, that we have all that groundwork, groundwork over, over, and we can hopefully, hopefully understand, understand it a little bit better. <clears throat> Not, Not chapter, chapter 5, chapter, chapter 1, one from, from verse 5. For to which of the angels did he say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he says, who makes his angels spirits and his ministers flame of fire? But to the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is in the scepter of your kingdom. You, are love, you have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with oil of gladness more than your companions. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you remain, and they will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak you will fold them up, and they will be changed, but you are the same. Your years will not fail. But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies a footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? <clears throat> so get a pen or a paper or just listen to this message again. I'm going to point out the cross-references. In fact, it's more direct than a cross-reference 
I'm going to show you where the verse is that he's quoting from in these in instances. And then I'm going to tell you the thing that he is highlighting about Christ. He doesn't explain these verses. He just simply introduces the idea uh, in verse 4. Has he by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they? Is he not greater than the angels who you revere so greatly and put so much emphasis on? <clears throat> who, if an angel gave you a message, your faith would not falter. And he quotes scripture. And he doesn't stop until he gets to the end of the chapter. In verse 5, he highlights Christ's sonship. In, in other words, um, the Son of God. In Mark even, and in Luke chapter 1, both chapter 1, it says, the God, the Son. <laughs> He's quoting from Psalm 2, the second psalm, and it highlights Christ's sonship. Verse 6 of Hebrews. He's highlighting Christ's worship, the worship that belongs to Christ, in other words, from the angels as well. And he's quoting from Psalm 97. In verse 7 of Hebrews, <coughs> he's highlighting Christ's king's kingship. His uh, right to sit on the royal throne. And he's quoting... From Psalm 104. Sorry, that's verse 8. Verse 7 is connected to verse 8. Verse 7 says, And the angels are ministers, ministers of, of God. But, but Christ, Christ is the, the one, one giving, giving the, the orders. orders. So, so those, those two, two verses, verses are connected. connected. In, In Psalm um, 104, which refers to verse 7, it says the angels are like the wind and fire. <laughs> that he's comparing aspects of angels to those things. They're invisible, they're, they're swift, they're unseen, yet ever-present. And that they're fire, that they bring uh, judgment and sometimes illumination, light and truth. But, but as, as powerful, powerful as they, they are, they, they still, still take, take orders. orders. Christ's kingship in verse 8. And he's quoting from Psalm 45 in verse 8 and 9. Verse 9 shows the kind of king that Christ is. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Verse 10, and this is the verse we're going to look at, 10, 11, 12, are all quoting from Psalm 102, 102. And in these three verses, three things about Christ are made clear. His, his eternality, his craftsmanship as creator and his once again his inheritance of all that he has redeemed so let's turn to psalm 102 
and then we'll consider what this says. <clears throat> so he quotes it almost word for word in Hebrews chapter 1, 10, 11, 12. In Psalm 102, he's quoting from 15, 6, um, sorry, 25, 26, and 27. Let's read it and you can have, if you're able to have both open or perhaps open up at Hebrews and let me read Psalm 102. It says, Of old you laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish but you will endure. Yes, they will grow old like a garment. Like a cloak, you will change them. And they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will never end. Christ as a creator, he reminds them that Christ, through Christ, the foundations of creation were laid, and even the things that are seen and unseen were all made by him. And it shows his superiority, that he is above all these things, he is greater than them. The angels that you revere and the things that you turn to, he made them. And he is eternal. The angels have a beginning. We have a beginning. But Christ is God. He does not have a beginning or an end. We hear in Sunday school all the time, who made God? Our minds cannot fathom an eternal being. He does not have a beginning. But that's impossible. No. <laughs> we just can't imagine. We have a beginning. We can't imagine something that doesn't begin and end. But Christ is that. His eternality, that heaven and earth he says he, he changes it like a garment. How often do we put our clothes in the wash and wash them and fold them and put on some new clothes? And everything that we know, everything in creation is as temporary to an eternal God. And his inheritance, of course, which we're going to look at in, in verse 13. So this is 10, 11, 12 was the first um, psalm I just wanted to actually read for you and show you. Psalm 13, oh, oh sorry, from verse 13 is another very interesting uh, quote here. And he's quoting from Psalm, uh, Psalm 2. Let me just get that right. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, no, not Psalm 2. Psalm... 110, my apologies, Psalm 110, let me uh, read that now, that's verse, verse 1 and 2. 2, the psalm is called the announcement of the Messiah's reign, a psalm of David, the Lord said to my Lord, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies, your footstool, the Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. 
rule in the midst of your enemies. You know, it goes on, and um, this would not be the first time the author of Hebrews quotes from the psalm. He goes on to quote it several times later on again. But, but it's, it's interesting, interesting, he said, the Lord, Lord said, said to my Lord. In Matthew 22, Christ refers to this psalm as well. And he's teaching the Pharisees and the Sadducees especially the supremacy and the superiority of Christ. And he talks about this psalm. In Matthew um, 22, let's, uh, let's quickly turn there. At the very end, verse 41. So this is Christ talking about himself and quoting this psalm with the same theological emphasis, his superiority. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, what do you think about the Christ, whose son is he? And they said, the son of David. He said to them, how then does David in the spirit call him Lord? Saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies a footstool. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? <clears throat> what Christ is saying is that he's the son of God. That he might be a descendant of David and the inheritor of an earthly throne, but he is the son of God. <clears throat> the Bible sometimes collectively calls angels the sons of God to show their, um, their proximity to God and that they inhabit heaven. But it, it only ever calls Christ the son of God. I asked, I asked you, you earlier, earlier, what would your response be if you saw an angel? Many people claim to have seen angels and had profound, received profound messages. It says, when, when someone, someone says that they received a message, that's how Islam was founded, that's how Mormonism was founded, that's how... Um, Jehovah's Witness was founded, uh, and many other similar schools of thoughts um, come from the idea of receiving some sort of message from a divine messenger. <clears throat> and we move heaven and earth metaphorically to do what this person what this messenger says. Establish religions and go on to convince countless people that I have received a message in good authority because I received it from an angel. Yet we show so much disdain in our Christian life to apply the words of Christ. If we have time in our calendar, if we don't have anything else going on, if it's convenient for us. The message that we receive is not from an angel, but the Son of God, God the Son that is superior over all things, that is supreme over all things. 
shouldn't we move heaven and earth <laughs> to cling to his words, to, to seek his truth in everything that we do, to treat this message with, with the, the reverence, reverence that we would show a fiery figure coming down from heaven. We want a 